Hi guys, how is everyone doing? It's a beautiful Saturday. Um, yes, it's a beautiful Saturday. Saturday. It's a beautiful Monday. <laughs> it's a beautiful Monday. And uh, I hope uh, you guys woke up with high energy and ready for the new week. So I'm going to start. Last time we stopped on chapter seven. I'm going to start from chapter eight. And I hope we can cover as much we're going. So let's go. Chapter eight, life in exile. <laughs> chapter four, chapter eight, life in exile. Looking to the future, that year, 1979, I bought a plot of land on William Street in Central Kampala under the name Midland Hotel. I had registered a company called Midland Hotel because I was determined to build a hotel one day to take forward the family occupation that started in with Nachito Hotel of Masaka. Unfortunately, my abrupt departure from the country in 1981 was to prevent my developing the plot in the stipulated five years time and Kampala City Council repossessed it during my absence. Otherwise, business was going on well for me throughout 1979 and 1980. But one day in 1980, we were driving on Entebbe Road with my brother Kasule Chivirige and my girlfriend and now wife Sophia Mwanga when we were stopped by stopped and arrested by UNLA soldiers near Clock Tower. Because my car had Kenyan registration plates, we were forced to drive home to Kansanga ostensibly for further searching. There, they robbed many expensive items from my house and then they took me for detention at Makinde Military Bala, oh, Barracks. <laughs> my brother, Kasule, refused to leave me and insisted on also being detained because he said he knew that I was innocent. His persistence must have complicated matters for the soldiers, and I believe it was what saved my life. We were arrested and jailed together, and in the cells I met Mr. Sam Juba, now deceased. deceased. He would later become he would later become Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs. We were later to collaborate in Nairobi in the further in the further ends of the political liberation struggle. The following day, we were the following day we were taken to the intelligence office in charge, a Tanzanian. After a lengthy interrogation, the Tanzanian told me he had been informed that I was a rebel supporter who frequently goes to Hong Kong and have satellite communication equipment, which I use for my underground activities. I explained to him that I imported different electronic gadgets, but for domestic use and entertainment and offered to buy him whichever such stuff if he wanted. We became friends and from that day, he released us and continued to accord me protection from harassment by Ugandan soldiers who either wanted to rob me or were being used by some people. Remember, I was successful, wealthy, and was attracting several envious business rivals. The Tanzanian officer also helped me to rescue two of my in-laws from certain death after they were arrested on strong suspicion of being rebel collaborators. One day, he disclosed to me that I was, I was a marked man. He first owned up and disclosed to me that he was a Muslim and a sheikh at that, but the nature of his work made him assume a Christian, Christian identity and his nom de guerre, Kenneth. <laughs> he came home and led us in prayer with, with such skill that left no doubt that he was indeed a Muslim cleric. We became real confidants and whenever we were together, he neither pretended to be Christian nor took any alcohol in my presence. Kampala became increasingly insecure and even some Tanzanian soldiers became quite unruly. I remember one time we were driving with my brother to see a patient at Mengo Hospital when a Tanzanian soldier stopped us on Namirembe Road. 
he was visibly drunk and was swinging his gun dangerously. He said to us, Niko na bundiki na nimelewa, nipe kila kintu mulicho nacho. I have a gun and I am drunk, give me whatever you have. We gave him all the money we had and our watches before he could let us go. Life was becoming increasingly precarious. One day in September 1981, I was in the office in town where I received a telephone call that my house in Kansanga was surrounded by troops. A fleeing business person accused of being a rebel supporter had entered my gate and escaped through the back door. The deployment was increased and as they searched everywhere in the house, another military team sent by, the Tanz by my Tanzanian friend came and there were now two forces in confrontation at my house. I never wasted a moment and just started making my way towards the Kenyan border. Indeed, the soldiers surely came to the office and arrested my brother Haruna. I arrived in Nairobi and had, and had no problem settling in since I was already doing business there. I also naturally started actively supporting the struggle. Business continued and the other thing that changed was that I could not step into Uganda. Otherwise, I continued supporting my extended family and relatives, especially paying school fees for all my siblings. Quite many, quite many in a polygamous setting and other cousins and their children as well. I prepared to stay in Nairobi for a long haul, for the long haul, with no idea when I would go back home. I went to Stuttgart in German and bought another Benz that I could use in my new home, Nairobi. Development House and Hilton Hotel were the two places where I chose to establish my two shops. In the evenings, my friends from Uganda would join me at, at Hotel Boulevard for tea and to catch up on events. I remember two of the cheekiest guys who used to make us laugh the whole evening. One was Paul Mbaba Wamala, who, whose father, ah, Mbaba, I went to school with the kid. Mbaba Wamala, whose father had disappeared without a trace in the mean era. The other was Frank Nekusa, who, who later became my friend, Karim Hirji's navigator in motorsport. He passed away recently. Wow. These two guys were always laughing and cracking jokes. Their laughter made exile bearable and we forgot the pain. I told them that I would build a hotel like Boulevard when I returned to Kampala. Mbaba being who he was never ceased to tease me. When we were opening Hotel Africana, he teased me that I had made a mistake. This was not Boulevard, but Serena, he chided. Of course, of course, we had a hearty laugh again, remembering the... Um, hold on. Oh, excuse me. In the in memory of the first of the of my first landing in Hong Kong, I registered Kowloon Kowloon Fashions in partnership with a Kenyan businesswoman, Veronica, who had been and was still doing business in Uganda. It was a legal requirement to have a Kenyan partner to register a company. I also gave Veronica valuable contacts in Kampala to further her businesses while in Uganda. Things were going on smoothly, both in Nairobi and in other countries as I globe trotted. I had started importing secondhand cars in Kenya as well as Uganda. On March 31st, 1982, I was supposed to make my first trip from Hong Kong to Japan to meet with the owners of Choi Car Corporation, my car suppliers. I was standing at the check-in counter of, of the Hong Kong airport when I rested my briefcase down and in an instant, a thief snatched it and disappeared in the crowd. It contained $52,000, a huge sum, sum at that time. My passport was also inside the briefcase. I started appealing for help, but after a few minutes, I was firmly requested to step aside so they would serve other passengers. I went and made a report to the police and blocked the traveler checks that had been in the briefcase worth about $800. I later redeemed that money, so it, I was not completely destitute for in foreign lands. 
I returned to the hotel and that night I was awoken by a phone call from Kampala. As I was receiving it, I hit my head against the bed and bled profusely. Wow. I had to be evacuated to hospital. The next days, the next day was April Fool's Day, and for some reason, the people in Kampala who liked cracking jokes thought my story was just another April Fool's prank. I gave up on I gave up trying to convince them that I was in real trouble. The Japan trip was obviously cancelled, but more importantly, I realized I could not go back to Kenya. The Hong Kong authorities had given me a one-way travel document to Uganda. At Bombay Airport in India, the authorities insisted that without a Kenyan passport, they could not put me on a plane to Uganda. Now that meant certain death for me, but it was none of the Indian authorities' business. I worked, I worked the phones and finally influential friends in Kenya fixed matters and I could fly to Nairobi. This mishap, however, helped me experience the test of true friendship and the benefits of trust in business. The family that owned Chiwa Handbag Company of Hong Kong stepped in and I was completely cushioned. Otherwise, I would not have suffered a major setback. Instead, they told me to take it easy and extended me credits to the tune of the amount. What? <laughs> to the amount I had lost in the theft giving me five years to repay all oh, in bits. I finished repaying them in 1987. Wow. That's amazing. That's crazy. Oh my goodness. Back home in Uganda, I gave instructions to sell off the Tata trucks and the commuter combis so we could run a tighter ship. After one year, I had sufficiently recovered and I visit, revisited the plans in uh, i revisited the plans to visit choi Ka corporation in japan in 1983 i traveled to nagoya and went to meet ayoma masao now deceased with whom i worked for for a very long time in japan i also met mr charles kasasa a ugandan who was staying in tokyo kasasa was well versed about matters Japanese and guided me a lot regarding doing business in Japan and relating with the people. He knew the culture and the language quite well. At first, I just traded in cars. After all, I always loved cars. In 1984, I bought a Mitsubishi Stallion, which wowed Nairobi Fox. The mesmerized passers-by around Hilton and Development House used to say Mchana in Alala, meaning it sleeps during the day, owing to the flaps that used to close the car's headlights. <laughs> in 1983, I got registered officially as a refugee alongside several other Ugandans in Nairobi, which accorded us protection of the Kenyan government because the Uganda authorities had intensified their hand for us in Kenya. I also got a uh, refugee passport. Business went on well locally in Nairobi and internationally. From Nairobi, my old friend, Mr. Rajin Shah. Rajin, Rajin. Seconded me, seconded me to open an account with NatWest Bank in London. An account I hold to this day and with, and which, which must now be one of their oldest accounts. Rajin is an old hand at business who deals in precious metals to death. He owns a shop in Entebbe International Airport that deals in jewelry. I am a shareholder in that business, although I am not involved in running it. I am what you would call a dormant shareholder. It was, it was in 1983, while on a trip to London, that I first got my master's credit card. I had been doing some shopping and I went to the bank branch several times, withdrawing several hundred pounds each time. The manager called me into his office and with concern and asked why I was making such large cash withdrawals. When I explained that I live and work in Africa, he said that I need a card and immediately started having one process for me. In 1985, while I was driving from Mombasa, I got a serious accident at a place called Makindu. It is just by God's grace that I survived, though with serious injuries. My knees were broken, 
and I spent some weeks in Nairobi hospital. When my condition became stable, I was flown to Germany where I had plastic cups fixed in my knees. From Germany, I flew to London where I was resting when reports came of the coup in Uganda on July 27th. General Tito Okelo Lutwa had overthrown the second Obote government. I flew back to Nairobi where the talks between NRM or stroke NRA and the new junta of the Okelo generals were soon to take place. I attended all the sessions of the peace talks, not as a delegate, but because they were open to the public. I would end up participating out our demonstration at the Nairobi International Conference Center, calling upon both parties to sign a peace agreement so that we could return home. Olara Otunu, who would later become a high-ranking United Nations official and later contest for presidency in 2011 as Uganda's People's Congress um, candidate, was the leader of the, of the government's delegation. However, I was rooting for NRA, stroke NRM. It was a peaceful demonstration using placards to send a message. A lot of Ugandans in exile took part in these peaceful demonstrations. As peace, a peace agreement was eventually signed in December that year, it collapsed almost immediately and intensive fighting resumed. On January 25th, 1986, the National Resistance Army overpowered the junta and took, and took over power. I packed my bags, returned to Uganda and registered BMK Uganda Limited. I had to include my brother and Aisha, my sister, as shareholders because by law, someone cannot open a limited company alone. I have those photos of him protesting. I found them. Um, chapter 9. Stripping used cars for spares. While while on uh, let me mm -hmm. while on a trip to Japan, I saw many people who were not Japanese in the vehicle. In they're not Japanese in the vehicle stripping yard of my friends, let Ayoma, Masao, and Takewachi. Each day, about thirty cars were being stripped apart. I asked Masao and Takowechi what these people were, were doing. They offered, they offered me a tour the following day. These people were mostly from Cyprus, Australia, New Zealand, and Sri Lanka who were looking for vehicle parts to export to their countries. In Japan, cars that are older than six years or with a high mileage are regularly stripped apart to get the steel to make other vehicles and steel and aluminum products to feed their industries. However, such cars, although considered old by Japanese standards, still have many useful parts such as headlights, which could be sold everywhere. Masao told me that these people buy these parts at giveaway prices and have, be and have become wealth wealthy in their countries of origin where they export these car spare parts. He introduced me to some of these businessmen, such as Naito, who I would later visit in Cyprus. He had made a fortune from selling used cars, used car spare parts. Before that, the more I spoke with Masao and Takowechi on the tour to their yard, the more I realized that this was a line of business, business that I needed to get involved in. I came back to Uganda and started planning to start the, the car spare part business. Unlike many of my other ventures, I did not even bother to do a survey or business plan to fully and business plan hmm, to fully understand the business. My adrenaline was already high. I just wanted to start this business. <laughs> However, although I love cars, I was not a mechanic. I approached the late John Kaliba. Oh my goodness, this guy worked worked in Deva, BMK Deva for until he died. He was there, Mr. John Kariba. Wow. Wow. 
the let the let John Kaliba, who was a mechanic of some repute in Kampala. I told him I wanted to take him to Japan for six months to strip cars of the spare parts before they are crushed. The plan was to load a forty a forty foot cargo shipping container every two weeks. Eh, every two weeks to Uganda. I told him that we would only get spare parts that have that have a market here in uganda but i did not know which parts were on demand as i was not a mechanic or involved in the spare markets business at that time i told him i would spend the first month in japan working directly with him kaliba asked me that what i would give him for abandoning his work to go to japan i had an incredibly beautiful car a toyota karina gt and i offered it to him he insisted that we sign an agreement. I give him its logbook and parked the car at a place of his choice. <laughs> he was a renowned mechanic, but we were not friends. So we did not know each other at th that, that much. I think he did not trust me that much. I also did not trust him that much either, but his knowledge of vehicles was not in doubt. Lesson to learn. It's not about what the other person like like if another person has a skill that you don't um just go and use that skill you know it's not like forget about ego about anything like if you're not good at something there's always someone good at better than me better than you at it so the lesson to learn from here is that use people's skills you cannot be good at everything you can outsource for people don't be mising because some people don't want to spend money to their friends who have a better skill than them so that's a lesson to learn like like be confident to outsource to your friends or people who have a better skill than you so that you get the result okay upon signing the agreement i started working on his travel documents which led us to flying to Nairobi in Kenya for the visa application process. At that time, visas to Japan were being issued at the Japanese embassy in Nairobi. I did not get any problem uh, securing a visa for Kaliba, and soon we were on a flight to the Far East. Upon reaching Japan, Kaliba started removing the car parts that he thought had a market back in Uganda while I arranged them for parking and loading into the cargo shipping containers. My friends in Japan gave us some people, gave us some people who trained Kaliba in using modern tools powered by compressors that would quickly enable him to remove the parts. Sometimes Kaliba and I simply parked and loaded the spare parts that others the, and others were removing from the vehicles. We enjoyed this type of work and generally our stay in Japan. In about three weeks, we had loaded a 40 foot container and were ready to ship it to Uganda. Once the ship left Japan, we flew back to Kampala to plan for the arrival of the goods. This was a new business, which I did not know much about. I approached businessman Haruna Semakula of General Parts or oh, rest in peace, he died recently, who was in the same business, who in turn referred me to Chita Simbwa, a famous Casper part dealer in Kampala. The latter was well known to me. Chita Simbwa agreed to buy, some, to buy my container as I looked for a place to start this business. He made a lot of money out of this transaction because once the container was at his business premises, other traders lined up to buy the spare parts. I remember what Masao had told me that people who are shipping spare parts to their countries had made a lot of money. Mind you, General Pass and Kitasimba were dealers in new spare parts. I rented a shop in Nabugabo, the center, the center of the car spare parts in parts trade in Kampala at that time, and I recruited my cousin Sarah Chibirige, a daughter of Uncle Kasule in Makere to manage it. We started, we started making a lot of sales, shipping in many containers. My sister Aisha and brother Haruna joined the business as well, while my brother Jingo was the customs clearing agent. We were, we were excited making a lot of money. Meanwhile, Kaliba's six-month contract was coming to an end in Japan. 
I needed somebody to replace him. I had paid fees for my nephew, Kasule, at Kisubi Technical School, who had studied mechanics and was unemployed. I recruited him uh, to replace Kaliba, who was returning to Uganda. The business for spare parts was now established, and I recruited more people to work in Japan. The spare parts business solved two major problems. First, the av availability of spare parts led to the reduction in car thefts. Pre previously, cars would be stolen and stripped to feed eh, to feed the spare parts trade in Kampala. When the spare parts are readily available on the market, less cars are stolen for their uh, spare pa parts. People used to steal cars to get engines to replace those that had mal malfunctioned and other parts. We were now importing used spare part engines into the country that were genuine and still good in, in good condition. Secondly, the old, the old used spare parts we were importing were genuine and much better than what other people were importing. At that time, people were importing fake parts if you look at, for example, the tail lights of a vehicle, the imitation fades within a few months, while the used ones last forever. Original spare parts, although old and used, are much better than new imitations. My brother Haruna joined me in Japan, and we, were, and we continued importing the spare parts. Whenever I could go to Japan, Haruna would go. Whenever I could not go to Japan, Haruna would go. We also continued importing used vehicles as well. I remember there was a time I had 44 cars at home. What? <laughs> as we stripped cars in Japan, we realized that some of the cars had new tires and tire rims. Most of them had spare parts, spare tires, which had not been used at all. On top of the spare parts and vehicles, we also started shipping containers of used car tires and rims. As we enjoyed the business, other Ugandans saw that we were making a lot of money and Japan became the preferred destination for many people who deal in many used uh, cars, spare parts and tires. This was the genesis of my spare parts business, not only in Uganda, but even in East and Central Africa, where I established my business. You guys, excuse me, I need to close the window. I think it's raining and I don't want stuff to get wet. Sorry, I'm back. Uh -huh. Meanwhile, Kaliba's six. Oh, I stopped there. I didn't. I finished. Okay. As we enjoyed, as we enjoyed business. Yeah, as we enjoyed the business, other Ugandans saw that we were making a lot of money and Japan became the pre preferred destination for many people who deal in mainly used cars, spare parts, and tires. This was the genesis of my spare parts business, not only in Uganda, but in East and Central Africa, where I established my business. Revolutionizing the border border transport. One day while in Japan looking for looking for cars and spare parts to export to Uganda, I came across a cache of used motorcycles. The other traders from Cyprus were removing some parts to export to their country. I immediately saw an opportunity. I inquired from Choi Car Com Corporation where I was stripping the car parts, the, the spare parts from, from, whether, from whether I could ship used motorcycles out of Japan. And I was informed that I could I immediately loaded them onto a cargo container for Uganda. A week after their arrival in Kampala, nobody was even asking the price. 
there was no market wow i had made a mistake and i had needed to do something or i was going to lose money i started thinking of what i needed to do to make a sale at the time kampala had many bicycle taxis and i had thought of selling my motorcycles to those who are in this business the bicycle taxis were commonly known as boda boda which is a direct translation for from border to border there is a strip there is a strip there is a strip of about one kilometer between the uganda and kenya border at busia oh it's one kilometer where the where the most common means of transport was by bicycle taxis the riders usually shouted border border while call, while calling customers while oh, while calling customers moving from one side of uganda or kenya's border hence the name border 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 bicycles spread from busia to all nearby towns and all the and all the way to kampala as a means of transport with my motorcycles in the store and nobody asking me about them i had to make a move so i approached the bicycle border border stage at Nab nabunya in kampala i identified two riders and gave each a motorcycle on credit i took their details including areas of residence as well as profile photos i took them to i i took them to abandon i told them to abandon bicycles for motorcycles i did the same at the other border stage border border stages in kabusu in nubaga najanankumbi and nankulabie all these are kampala suburbs these riders were to pay me every day and soon customers were not interested in bicycles anymore more riders approached me wanting to buy motorcycles i had to get more motorcycles from japan in the end i turned the industry on its head with operators abandoning bicycles for motorcycles although there are still some bicycle border border in kampala and other parts of the country today border border in africa is, is essentially by motorcycle yeah <laughs> daddy yeah! oh my goodness that was you that was you i'm so proud of you dad i'm so proud of you okay i'm uh, i'm so proud of him so much i am oh he said i am enormously proud of this of this because the border border industry provides millions of direct jobs and has erased the way business is done in uganda and almost everywhere in africa today there are taxi hailing smartphones apps like safe border where people order for border border the same way the same the same way people globally order for uber taxis in major cities I did this business of importing motorcycles until 2005 and I must say I made a lot of money. There was less competition until Bajaj and other Indian motorcycle brands started dominating the market in Uganda. I had started importing new new ones from China, but the business did not go as planned after I was shortchanged by the manufacturer with inferior quality motorcycles. I had created the BMK motorcycle brand with the Chinese manufacturer and I had thought I was going to become filthy rich. The first consignment instead almost killed the BMK brand. I am very cautious of the name BMK and I do not want it to be associated with inferior products or to be involved in shady deals. That is how I have built my fortune for more than four decades. The motorcycles from China were one of the biggest business disappointments of my business career. I decided to quit the motorcycle trade and concentrate on other businesses. Besides, the industry had been saturated, saturated by Indian brands and I was not ready to compete with them. With the spare parts business growing by the day, I opened more branches with some concentrating on used Japanese car tires and rims i opened a branch in bale and other towns 
as well as Tanzania, Zambia, and Kenya. I was making good money in all these markets, which provided the resources to build Hotel Africana. I am still involved in the spare parts business, though there is a lot of competition today. Finding a fortune in lifting equipment and heavy machinery. One day as I was about, one day as I was going about my business with my friend Takochi in Japan, I saw a four-ton crane and I, and I realized that it would be very handy in lifting building materials during the construction of Hotel Africana. Takechi took me to a Japanese businessman called Fukaya who told who sold and hired out cranes and lifts. He agreed to sell a four-ton crane to me. I remember it was blue in color. My sole purpose was for easing the construction of Hotel Africana. When I arrived in Kampala, it did not do what I had bought it for. People started hiring the crane all over the place. <laughs> It was soon busy every day, making me a lot of money. I went back to Fukaya. I wanted to buy more cranes and forklifts. Fukaya was a wealthy businessman with many branches in Japan. He asked me whether he could trust me, and I told him he could, and I will not disappoint him. I was with Takoshi, who was also extending me a lot of credit in the spare parts business. They were also giving me cars on credit to sell in Africa. I am probably lucky because many people trusted me with a lot of goods on credit you can you can even say that that in the story of this book being trustworthy has helped me prosper when i say that fukaya was wealthy i want you to know that it is an understatement he died recently and may his soul rest in eternal peace he used to fly by private helicopter and had a yacht with <laughs> which we enjoyed well in Japan. His company was called Nishiojuki. He helped me a lot to establish my heavy machinery and lifting business. He first gave me a 20-ton crane on credit, telling me that I needed it since I had already bought a 4-ton one. Uh, he gave me machinery worth millions of dollars on credit. He liked me just like Takoshi and Masao. He came to visit me in Uganda and Kenya several times. Wow. He loved joking a lot. One of his trips, I decided to take him to Carnival restaurant in Nairobi for dinner. The, the Carnival is famous for game meat. On learning that there was a, there's crocodile meat on the menu, Fukaya insisted that we must all start by eating it. We asked him why he was insistent, and he said, we must first eat before he reveals his reason. So we ate, eagerly waiting for his reason. When we were done eating, Fukaya said that if a crocodile had a chance to eat us, it would have eaten all of us. <laughs> Since it was our chance, we had to eat it. He said to all our newsmen, I think these Japanese friends liked me because I was trustworthy and very hardworking. One time in the middle of winter in Japan, I found myself I found myself working hard, loading a container. Fukaya found me working as it rained on me. I think he felt sorry for me. And yet when he visited me in Uganda, he realized I was also successful because I had a beautiful home. I was being driven in a Mercedes Benz and life was generally good. But I think seeing me working in the rain showed him my humility and strong work ethic. All these factors must have influenced his decision to continue extending a lot of credit to me. When then the government of Uganda decided to start building another dam in Jinja in the mid 1990s, the contractor came to hire my crane. I had only two at the time. I had only two at the time, but they asked me whether I could get another one. With Fukaya by my side, I knew it would get I would get any crane they needed. The contractor said he wanted a 45 ton crane and I went back to Fukaya for it. 45. He gave, he gave it to me on credit and more equipment worth a lot of dollars. With these cranes busy at the dam on long-term contracts, they created a void in the market. Many people were knocking on the doors for cranes and heavy lifting equipment. I went back to Fukaya and he sold me another 20 ton crane 
to fill the gap. All this was possible because I was trustworthy. Fukaya's company, Fukaya's company general manager, Maida, is still a close friend to this day. I would not also have managed to fulfill all these assignments and obligations if my siblings, Haruna, Jingo, Aisha, and many others were not supportive as well. They handled the money with integrity, which enabled us to pay back our creditors. My brothers, Kasule and Ahmad, uh, also supported me, Kamada, supported me in one way or another. We were in spare parts, in BMK Industries of Plastics, heavy machinery, motorcycles, and many other businesses in Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, Kenya, and elsewhere. I am always grateful to them because I would not have managed on my own. I took many of my relatives to Japan to work in the vehicle stripping yards, and some made good money because the yard owners paid them weekly allowances as well. Yet they were not spending money on anything. Food was provided. You only simply had to had to like eating rice to survive because that is a main food in Japan. Chicken is also commonly eaten and it is very affordable, so it was easy for them to save. Some, some came back with their own vehicles and invested well. Of course, some mismanaged their money. But people like Kasule Mohammed, Songole, and Kaliba invested their money very well. With the crane market fully established here in Uganda, we moved to Tanzania, Zambia, and Kenya. When Takoshi became old, he sold his company to Mr. Kato of Wind Company, which is a big company in the Aichi prefecture dealing in new and used cars, as well as spare parts. Takuchi introduced him to me, introduced him to me, and we continue working very well with him. Kato, Kato is an exceptionally good partner and has been there for us. One of his staff called Ota has also been supportive. They love me and love my family. As you will read in this book, I have introduced my children to these partners and they are the ones mostly dealing with them today as I no longer travel as much as I used to. In venturing into business, businesses and trade, I would not have succeeded if the following people were not key players in my life. The late Ayoma Masao, who taught me a lot of business, a lot of things regarding secondhand car parts and secondhand cars. Takochi and the late Ayoma, may his soul rest in peace. I hold them in quite high regard in my life for the tremendous business guidance, support, and care uh, they have extended to me since my venturing into Japan trade to date. The late Fukaya and Nikichio Yuki. He supported me with millions of dollars worth of credit. May his soul rest in peace. Kato, president and chairman of Win Company and many other successful businesses in Japan. Despite his extra busy schedule, he always found time for me to extend that he, yeah, that he visited my businesses both in Uganda and in Zambia. Up to date, we still have a good working relationship. Ota, manager of the export department in Win Company, is still a good and supportive business friend, which friendship has extended to our families. Among others, I cannot forget Miss Minako Kamiya. They are all here in photos. Oh, yeah, let's look at some photos. Let's look at photos. These are photos in Japan. In the yard and this is them loading this was them loading the loading the these are the Japanese friends that's my uncle his brother hmm. this is mr takoshi and this is the other family he's talking about he went to visit his dear friend
and these are other photos okay today we are finishing early i will do chapter 10 10 and 11 next week i mean next tomorrow 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 we're going quick i think tomorrow i'll do three chapters because the other one is short so next week we'll do this chapter um setting up bmk industries thanks for watching today guys i uh, see you tomorrow it was nice hold on before i go what did i learn today what did i learn today i learned today that it's still like uh, every day i learned i learned like taking risk is okay it's okay to check the risk but specifically today i learned from that story where he contracted that mechanic guy and he paid for him his trip to japan i learned that people like i don't want to be that kind of person who holds on to money just because they don't want to pay a professional and i've been realizing like maybe i have that habit a little bit and i need to let go of it so i will start contracting people and trusting people who i know have a, high, a much higher skill oh yeah and then the other thing i learned is uh, okay not learned but it emphasizes it is uh, trust like earning people's trust can get you so far away earning people's trust can enable them even give you their business secrets without a doubt like being trustworthy is really really key in being successful so that's what uh-huh and then also i wanted to say that like do you know like rich people they use money as a tool like meaning if he if he didn't have money he wouldn't have been able to buy like those trucks and then uh -huh. and then also when he lost like fifty thousand dollars that story always inspires me and like this is for any young person who goes through a hard time like he lost fifty thousand in the 80s and it was during his trip and he was stuck so this 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 makes you understand that sometimes money is, is just a tool you know it's just a tool to get you where you need to go because in that moment when the money was stolen it was his friends that actually helped right like his business friends so while you're making money also make the partner those meaningful friendships and not just be best off of money because then it takes away the humanness of the interaction yeah that's what i learned today i hope you learned something and see you tomorrow have a nice day please be active please be productive do not procrastinate let's get this okay bye